Hi, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Workman. And what I'm going to do here is go through the answer key to this practice test and explain some of these answers to you as we're going through them. So um, just look at these multiple choice questions to start here. Uh, this is, um, you know, really just talking about when you heat gas that's really increasing its temperature. And what you need to remember is that kinetic energy is energy of movement. And um, what we've talked about in terms of the kinetic molecular theory of energy is that when you increase temperature, really what you're doing is you're increasing the average speed of the particles of the, of the substance that you're increasing the temperature of. So that's why the answer here is increases. So really what we're saying there is that the particles get faster as the temperature increases. Uh, pressure uh, by a gas is actually, to me, um, I didn't really write these answers really well. To me, it's both the number of collisions or the frequency of collisions between gas molecules as well as other types of gas molecules, and then the uh, uh, collisions against the wall of the container. So really, I circled both C and D for answer two. We know that pressure comes from the force of collisions distributed over a particular amount of area. Um, when we talk about decreasing pressure, there's a couple of things that can do that, but the only possible answer here is to let some of the particles of helium out of the tank. You could decrease pressure by increasing the volume of the tank, decrease the temperature of the tank, but really right here, what we need to do is just decrease the number of particles here. That's That means allowing some of the helium to leak out. So that's why A is the answer for number three. For number four, um, decreasing the volume causes an increasing uh, amount of pressure because what happens is particles have less move, room to move around, and so the chance that they're going to collide uh, with one another and with the sides of the container in which they're um, stored, uh, they're going to coll collide more frequently as a result. And so more collisions means more pressure. Number five, um, why is an increased temperature causing an increase in pressure? Well, really, it's going to be um, the particles are going to be moving faster, so that means they gain more kinetic energy. And so what that means is collisions occur more often as well as with more force, because force is really um, a question of um, not only um, the mass of these particles, but how fast they're moving. So the faster an object moves and collides with another object, the more force it exerts upon that other uh, object. So I circled C for both A and B here. Highest pressure, of course, means greatest amount of collisions. So what you have to think about here for number six is what is it going to do? How can we increase the number of collisions? Well, a couple things you can do. You can decrease volume of our gases um, and increase temperature. And so uh, the other thing to think about is the number of particles. So if you have a mole of gas particles, that's that magic 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd number. Um, at a higher temperature and a smaller volume, this is the highest temperature, smallest volume, that is going to be the highest pressure situation. So I circled D. Um, in a sample of helium gas, all atoms move at the same speed. It's not actually true. They have um, different speeds. Different particles um, are not all moving at the same speed according to our kinetic molecular theory of energy. Now, this is a mess of information here. Um, when we look at these graphs, I, I put them all together here with the pressure volume axis labels, and that's not appropriate for some of these questions, but just bear with me here. If I look at number eight here, which graph represents the relationship between pressure of a gas and the absolute temperature? The one that works is this one, because as temperature increases, volume, um, excuse me, as temperature increases, pressure increases. And this only works really if we've got this line going through the origin. You got to remember that that's only going to go through the origin of a graph if the temperature is expressed in kelvins. All right. If it were expressed in, uh, if we were using the degree Celsius units, then the line would go through a point on the graph labeled negative negative 273 degrees Celsius. I know the axes are mislabeled on this. Just bear with me and just look at the shape of the line. Um, for number nine, the graph that rep. Re the graph that represents the relationship between pressure and volume is this one. It's the one that looks like a reverse J. What this means, of course, is that as one goes up, the other goes down. Um, and that's what we call an inverse relationship. With the reverse J-shaped graph like this, that's our inverse relationship. For um, a graph that looks like this with a constant slope, a linear uh, function type graph, what that refers to is a direct relationship. That means as one goes up, so too does the other. Uh, for number 10, which graph represents the relationship between volume and absolute temperature? Graph B is the one that works there, too. Um, and the uh, relationship between volume and number of moles of gas, that also is graph B. So if we label them all correctly with the correct label axes, um, oops, I should undo that. 
um, this this set of four graphs, of course, uh, these are the ones with the correct labels. All right. All right. Now, looking at number twelve here, the box um, that would have the lowest pressure, of course, would be the one with the greatest volume. The reason why is um, there's the most room for these particles to navigate around in, and um, the number of collisions would be the lowest number. Moving on to number 13, this is a volume temperature problem. Uh, the tricky thing about these things is that you have to identify your variables. Um, now, here, this is the initial state. That, that means beginning state. All right? right there, that means my first volume is one liter. Um, so the diagram below left, that's this one right here. Uh, it shows a representation of the sample gas at 400 kelvins. That means my first temperature associated with one liter of volume is 400 kelvins. Um, which of the following, so which of these four, that is, which represents the same gas uh, at negative 73 degrees Celsius if the pressure remains constant? All right, so what we're doing here is we're um, changing the temperature, but what you've got to do is calculate this in Kelvin, and simply to do that, all you do is you add 273. That changes the Kelvin temperature for negative 73 degrees Celsius degrees Celsius to 200 Kelvin. So what I did there is I listed temperature 2 as 200 degrees Kelvin. Now this is our overall formula. We know V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. To try to isolate my unknown variable, which is V2 here, that's my unknown. There's my unknown right there. Uh, what I did is I multiplied both sides by T2. What that does is it cancels this T2, it cancels that T2. So what I'm going to do here is then rewrite that in this way. You can't get rid of the T2 over here, and you can't get rid of any of these other variables, but we can rewrite it this way. T2 times V1 divided by T1 should equal V2. And so what I do is once I have it in that more useful form of the formula, I can substitute my numbers. T2 was temperature 2, uh, 200 Kelvin. 400 Kelvin is temperature 1, so over here. 1 liter is my volume 1. Multiply that out, divide it, units cancel, and so my ending answer for V2, of course, is half a liter, which is the same thing as 0 0.53. Right, now I know this, this numbering is off, but don't worry about that. Um, <clears throat> when you warm up water, just like in a gas, what that means is the particles go, get moving faster. And so what I've done is I've represented that with longer arrows. When we draw particle pictures, the particles that have longer arrows, that means they're moving faster. All right, and if they're moving faster, I just indicate that by longer arrows again, that means they're warming, warmer. Okay, faster particles means more kinetic energy on average. Number 10, what that means here, we've got this box, uh, what, that means, what this is here, we've got this box at the left has a higher temperature. How do we draw that? Well, again, the box on the left here has longer arrows. The box on the right has relatively shorter arrows. Um, this means higher temperature. We know that particles of greater average kinetic energy that is higher temperature. The other thing to realize is that if these volumes are the same, this box on the left would have higher pressure as a result of the greater kinetic energy and the increased frequency of collisions of these particles. Number 11, if the number of particles on the left um, hand box were doubled, what would happen to the pressure of the gas? Well, what that would ultimately result in is a doubling of the pressure. If you double the number of particles, what that's going to do is it increase or double the amount of frequency uh, of the collisions, which would double the pressure. Moving on now to these quantitative problems where you've got to do some math and some algebra. Uh, what we have here, that the container of carbon dioxide has a volume of 240 milliliters at a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. 240 milliliters is V1, 22 degrees Celsius is T1. Remember, you always have to convert these values to Kelvin for our formulas to work. What we're looking for is what is the second volume. We know that's our unknown variable, and this is our second temperature. So what I did is I went ahead and I listed those variables. Obviously, I converted these numbers to Kelvin numbers. Here's my formula for volume-temperature relationships. We know volume and temperature are directly related. So any V1 divided by its corresponding temperature should be equal to any other volume divided by its corresponding temperature. To get this to a more useful form, what I've done is I've multiplied both sides by T2. That means I've got T2 times V1 divided by T1, which will equal V2. Once I have it in this useful form of this formula, what I can then do, of course, is substitute my numbers. you got to read your list, plug in your numbers, do the math. Uh, Kelvins cancel Kelvins, obviously, and so my unit that isn't crossed out is going to travel into my answer.
temperature. And if you know that milliliter is a volume unit, you really don't need to worry about that. But sometimes if you forget what unit is for what type of measurement, this will help you. So my answer here was 257.9 milliliters. Let's check and see if this makes sense. Um, temperature went up, so volume should go up. Did volume go up? Yes, it went from 240 milliliters to 257.9 milliliters. So chances are my algebra is correct. In this situation, what I have is a pressure and temperature relationship. I give, I'm given a pressure right here, to, uh, excuse me, 26 pounds per square inch, a particular temperature, 27 degrees Celsius, so you always have to convert that to Kelvin. And then if we increase the pressure to 29 pounds per square inch here, what is the new temperature? So again, I made that list of variables here. P1 is 26 PSI, T1 is my 298K. The second pressure is 29 PSI, and the second temperature is my unknown. This is our formula. This is our general formula for pressure temperature relationships. This is a direct relationship. If temperature goes up, pressure will go up. If temperature goes down, pressure should go down. Anyway, what I'm going to do is do a little bit of algebra here to rearrange this to make it more useful to us. This is my unknown. I have the unknown variable on one side of the equal sign and the variable that I do know on the opposite side of the equal sign. Um, you should be able to do the algebra to make this setup be more once you have this useful form, what you can do is then plug in your numbers that you know. P2 was 29 pounds per square inch. T1 was 298 kelvins. P1 was 26 pounds per square inch. The pounds per square inch cancel each other, and so I know my units are going to be in kelvins. The unit that doesn't get crossed out goes with the answer. 29 times 298, get that answer. Divided by 26, your answer should be 332.4 with our Pacific Head representative. Okay. Number 14. Here's my first volume, 250 milliliters. This is a pressure. Uh, kilopascals is a pressure, 105 kilopascals. So there I've listed those inf that information. Uh, and I'm asking for the new pressure, and I changed the volume to 375 milliliters. All right, so we went from 250 milliliters to 375 milliliters. That's an increase in volume, so you should think, all right, pressure and volume, they're inversely related. If one goes up, the other goes down. So volume went up, you should be able to predict that the pressure will go down. <clears throat> this is my list of data. This is my form, my formula, my mathematical model to express the relationship between pressure and volume. P times V is going to be our constant, so P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Uh, I'm going to rearrange that a little bit. What I've done here is I've divided both sides by V2 equal to this, and I'm going to have this useful form of formula where my unknown is on one side of the equal sign and the variables that I do know is on the other side of the equal sign. I can substitute my numbers based on my list of data from here. Here's my 105 kilopascals. Here's my 250 milliliters. Divide that by my second volume, 375 milliliters. Do the math, cancel the units. My, un my uncanceled unit travels to my answer. And so then I've got 70 kilopascals. Yes, the pressure went down and then went up. That makes sense. You're probably right. Now, this one is a situation where we have a combined gas law where we have six total variables, five of them are known. This is the combined gas law formula. And simply what it does is it combines all the other constants that we've developed. P times V equal to T is equal to any other P times V over T, no matter how these values correspond to one another. So here's my values. 806 milliliters is my first volume given. 26 degrees Celsius is my first temperature given. Of course, I've got to convert that to Kelvin by adding 273. Here is my first pressure given, 998 millimeters of mercury is a pressure. Here this says find the volume, so that's my unknown, right? And then I've got zero degrees Celsius, that's the second temperature given, and of course I've got to convert that to Kelvin. Here's where that's done. And then 760 millimeters is my second pressure. Now this is a little bit complicated because two things are changing. Temperature's going down, and pressure's also going down. So in order to rearrange this formula to make it convenient for us, what I'm trying to do is isolate my unknown variable, which is heat, on one side of the equal sign, Put all my known variables on the other side of the equal sign. So there are some algebra steps involved here. If I have my combined gas law formula, what I'm going to do to get started here is multiply both sides by T2. What that does is it cancels this T2. It moves the T2 over here. So I, what I get is P1 times V1 times T2 over T1 is equal to P2 times V2. Now, uh, the next step here to isolate my V2 is to divide both sides by T2. That'll cause my um, P2 
repeat to cancel, right? That would cancel this one, but then it adds it down here. So then this is the useful form of the formula for my unknown V2. Now that I have this, we've got to think about some things here. Order of operations is important here. What you need to do is multiply all these terms together, get that answer, then divide it by the product of these two numbers. What you can't do is multiply all these two together, then divide by this, then multiply by this. So you've got to put parentheses around these terms to make sure your order of operations is correct. I would also list, when you plug in your numbers, list your units so that uh, your units cancel and so that you know whatever unit that didn't get canceled is going to travel to your answer. So my unknown new volume here would uh, increase to 966 milliliters. Uh, the reason for that increase is a pretty dramatic drop. Pressure went down pretty far here. And even though temperature went down, and that would, that would make you think um, volume would go down, this temperature differential between 299 Kelvins and 273 Kelvins is really not that substantial. All right, well, that's it for the answer key for your practice unit 2 test. Hope you learned something, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye.